Ron Sachs here, the head of the local Red Cross Action Group, supplied the slides that, that, that were shown that, that showed so people could have a sense of uh, what the Red Cross felt like and looked like. And um, the other thing about that is in 1987, I started a youth action training organization. I mostly thought we were going to work on war and peace issues. And then I got to talking to Bobby here, and he started telling me about the rain forest. It's the first time I really started to think about it. And what he said to me was that, he says, there may or may not be a war, and uh, that may or may not be an issue with the rain forest. It's definitely going. And we're going to do something to stop it from going. It's going to be gone. Of course, he was right about this war thing, since our major issue seems to have at the moment been put on the shelf. And the rainforest hasn't slowed down. And it turned out that most of the kids we were working with were more concerned about the rainforest than anything else. So all of this became primarily a rainforest organization. And I've gotten to the place now where I've become a fanatic about the rainforest. I feel the rainforest is a litmus test for humanity. Um, if, if we can bring our consciousness together as a species to save the rainforest, I think we have a chance to survive on this planet. If we don't, I don't think we're going to. I just don't think we're going because that's an obvious issue when it's right in our face. And it's in every space. Um, in 1989, Jason Clay and Ben Cohen were, were at a Creating Our Future, that's the youth group I mentioned, summer camp. And we were talking about what the back of the Urban Forest crunch box is going to say, the, the candy that Ben Cohen put together. And I said, if we really want people to read the back of a box, you've got to come out with a cereal box. And they said, uh, well, you know, who, who knows anyone who makes cereal? I said, I do. So I went from an activist only to uh, another manufacturer, and here's the bag of cereal box we were talking about, which I'm somewhat proud of. Um, and mostly what I want to say is that I think there's becoming in this country a, a new way to do business and to be a business person. And it's a very different model. It's just starting, I think. It's a very different model from the most sophisticated business people these days, they talk about, you know, the, the uh, three rings and looking at the Japanese model and being at war and being at business as being at war in a certain sense. And uh, I'm in business to, uh, to, uh, make, to make some money, but I'm in business to, to serve the planet and to cooperate with the people that I'm working with. So that all of us who are competitive in selling different rainforest products are all one way or another trying to work together and, and make this market work. And the exciting thing about what I'm doing is that I, I am, I'm not alone in this, but I, I am in the happy position of having a product for sale about which I can say that the more we sell, the more we sell this cereal, the more we serve the people in the rainforest, and the more we serve the rainforest, and the more money we get. say that the, uh, the Boston Area Rainforest Action Group essentially acts as the Boston chapter, if you will, the national group called the Rainforest Action Network. Uh, this is not a simple issue, but in some sense it's very simple. Uh, it has to do with saving forests and saving the cultures that live in the forest. Boston, what does Boston have to do with this? There are two main connections. One is that Things that cause deforestation do have to do with our daily lives in Boston, particularly in terms of consumption, the policies of the United States, and some of the corporations that we can affect. The effects of deforestation will be felt in Boston. I think that the quality of lives for us, and especially for our children and grandchildren, will be seriously influenced by the loss of the rainforest. Uh, suffice it, we have some uh, literature here. We have a newsletter we put out, which are copies here. and. Uh, a little cheeky this is what can I do in Boston to save tropical forests? And the answer is join this group here. There's a lot of things we do and are going to do. On the 10th of October, Thursday night, we're having a lecture, part of our lecture series at uh, 3 Joy Street. And I would suggest people can come to that. Uh, 7.30 3 Joy Street, and hear a fellow named Jonathan Schwartz who's been uh, filming uh, rainforest issues for over a decade. It should be very interesting. We obviously feel that, along with Jason, that any kind of sustainable use of the forest is an almost essential aspect for saving the forest. 
And this is a perfect example of that in action. Dr. Leary, questions? Five percent. What uh, what does that make your profit margin then? Um, we're so new, and I said clear on what our profit margin is. Um, our markup is is is, is an industry standard. It's about twenty five percent. Twenty five percent. I think we've probably been <coughs> skipped over one important point. Uh, this cereal tastes great, <laughs> and it's uh, superior nutrition. And beyond that, <clears throat> it makes eating breakfast and an environment environmentally responsible act. Now you can't beat that. Yeah. Another question? Yes. Can you talk a little bit about the concept of extractive reserve in you know, some more detail? Uh, extractive reserves were invented in Brazil as a way to transfer the ownership of large areas of the Amazon from individual very wealthy uh, owners who used to uh, sell rubber on the Brazilian market into the hands of the people who live there, uh, who were in most cases like tenants or sharecroppers. Um, what happened is that the government took over the land and allows the people who live in the forest now to use it as long as they live there. What we're doing is working very closely with some of these, these groups, particularly rubber tappers in the western part of Brazil, to allow them to begin to process the commodities that they have harvested from the forest and sell them directly onto the world market themselves. Uh, we built the first nut shelling factory in the western part of Brazil that's actually uh, owned by the people who collect Brazilians in the forest. The factory allows them to receive not the 2 to 3% of the New York uh, wholesale price that they used to get for their nuts, but something on the order of 65% uh, today. The factory also now, by buying 5% of the nuts in the western state uh, of Brazil called Acre, uh, by buying 5% of the nuts and by doubling the price that the factory pays to collectors, that has become the industry-wide standard so that all rubber tappers in that western state have demanded a doubling of the price that they received for Brazil nuts this year. And the price for the income generated went from 